The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And um, we're going to continue our uh, uh, 14th segment and series on um, History Unveiling Prophecy, or Time as an Interpreter, an original work by uh, H. Cratan Guineas. Uh, of course, I've taken it and republished it and updated it a little bit and kind of reorganized it. And uh, so anyway, you can get a copy of that by uh, going to our website at crosstheborder.org to get the book page. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's a link there. It says uh, low-cost pocketbook editions there, and you'll see it pop up. I mean, you hit that link if you want to get a copy of this. Uh, every uh, true prophecy student should have this in their library. This is not popular prophecy uh, because the Antichrist uh, controls most of major media definitely controls where the money goes. Um, as prophesied, yes, uh, the Counter-Reformation has been very effective, and it has been at work, and especially over the last 200, and, uh, you know, since really the, the turn of the uh, 19th century, or the end, uh, about the time of the French Revolution, uh, the Counter-Reformation has taken a very different tactic on how it works because it had to work behind the scenes with the fall of the papacy and the end of its 1260 year temporal reign and they kept working. There are several works out there that you can uh, available as to how they work and especially if you want uh, to really get a good education uh, try uh, Tom Fress's website inquisitionupdate.org. Uh, he goes through a lot of historical documentation on uh, just that topic. But we're jumping into uh, history unveiling prophecy. It is a historicist uh, view, uh, one more historicist view of the book of Revelation and that interpretation. And we left off on page 138. So we're going to go there and pick up where we left off. Uh, 138, the third vial. The slaughter in papal lands, watered by the alpine fountains and streams, and by the boundary rivers, the Rhine and upper Danube, followed. It seemed natural to apply the third vial to this dreadful retributive judgment. Albert Barnes notices that four points as to this vial are clear. One, that it would succeed the first mention, and apparently at a period not remote. Two, that it would occur in a region where there had been persecution. Three, it would be in a country of streams and rivers and fountains. Four, it would be a just retribution for the bloody persecutions which had occurred there. With this interpretation, he follows Eliot, who says, during the year 1792, war was declared by France against Germany, and the next year against Sardinia. Consequently, all those towns watered by the Rhine and Alpine streams became scenes of carnage. Mets, worms, spires, the towns formerly desolated by Attila, suffered. Another French army entered upon the countries situated on the Meuse, a branch of the Rhine. A third advanced to Piedmont, the Alpine frontier. In 1793 and 1794, war still raged in the same quarters. The French advanced to Holland, and in many places, 
the success fluctuated, but in most instances they were victorious. At last Charles of Austria drove their generals, Moru and Jordan, with their armies back to the Rhine. In A.D. 1797, Bonaparte attacked the Sardinians and Austrians. The course he tracked was from the Alpine rivers through northern Italy. Till he reached Venice, every river was a scene of carnage, and he crossed seven in succession. The Alpine rivers turned to blood. It was 1797 that Bonaparte uttered the remarkable threat, I will prove an Attila to Venice. Before peace could be restored, Austria was forced to submit, and the Treaty of Campio Formio stipulated that the Valley of the Rhine, one part of the prophetic scene, together with the Austrian Netherlands and the Palatinate on one side of the Rhine, and Wartenberg, Bavaria, Baden, and Westphalia on the other, should all be made over to France. Again in 1799, the fountains of waters were dyed with blood. The French, having suffered reverse and been driven out of all the places they occupied in North Italy with much bloodshed, the war soon recommenced. In 1800, the terrible and decisive battle of Marengo was fought, and the Danube became the scene of judgment. One victory after another succeeded, till the memorable Battle of Austerlitz completed the overthrow of the Austrian power. The reason given by the angel for the judgment is remarkable. They are worthy, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. Was it not so that the cruelties of the French and Piedmont and the rulers of Savoy against the Waldenses and Albigenses, the Huguenots and the Calvinists, from the end of the 13th to the end of the 18th century, and of Austria against the Hussites, the Waldenses, and Lutherans of Lombardy, Moravia, and the Netherlands, already related, did call out for retributive justice. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The fourth vial. In regard to the application of this vial, Barnes, the commentator who follows Eliot, says, the following things may be remarked. A. That the calamity here referenced to was one of the series of events which would precede the overthrow of the beast and contribute to that, or to this, for to this all these judgments tend. B. In the order in which it stands, it is to follow and apparently to follow soon the third judgment, the pouring of the vial upon the fountains and streams. See, it would be a calamity such as if the sun, the source of light and comfort to mankind, were smitten and became a source of torment. D. This would be attended by great destruction of men, and we should naturally look in such an application for the calamities in which multitudes of men would be as it were, consumed. E. This would not be followed, as it might be hoped it would, by repentance, but would be attended with reproaches of God, with profaneness, and with great increase in wickedness. Remember, they repented not of their idolatries. Now, on the supposition that the explanation of the previous passage is correct, there can be no great difficulty in supposing that this refers to the wars of Europe following the French Revolution, the wars that preceded the direct attack on the papacy and the overthrow of, pap of the papal government, for these events had all the characteristics hereto referred. A. They were one of a series in weakening the papal power in Europe, heavy blows that will yet be seen to have been among the means preliminary to its final overthrow. B. They followed in their order the invasion of northern Italy, for one of the purposes of that invasion was to attack the Austrian power there, and ultimately through the Tyrol 
to attack Austria itself. Napoleon, after his victories in northern Italy, above referred to, thus writes to the French Directory, Connie, Siva, and Alexandria are in the hands of our army. If you do not ratify the convention, I will keep their fortresses and march upon Turin. Meanwhile, I shall march tomorrow against Bolu and drive him across the Po. I shall follow close at his heels, over all Lombardy, and in a month be in the Tyrol, join the army of the Rhine, and carry our united forces into Bavaria. The design is worthy of you, of the army, and of the destinies of France. See, the campaign of Germany in 1796 followed immediately this campaign in Italy. Thus, in chapter 2 of Allison's history, we have an account of the campaign in Italy. In chapter 11, we have an account of the campaign in Germany and the other wars in Europe that continued so long and that were so fierce and bloody followed in quick succession, all tending in their ultimate results to weaken the papal power and to secure its final overthrow. D. It is hardly necessary to say here that these wars had all the characteristics here supposed. It was as if the sun were smitten in the heavens, and power were given to scorch men with fire. Europe seemed to be on fire with musketry and artillery, and presented almost the appearance of a broad blaze of a battlefield. The number that perished was immense. These wars were attended with usual consequences, blasphemy, profaneness and reproaches of God in every form. And yet there was another effect wholly in accordance with the statement here that none of these judgments brought men to repentance, that they might give God the glory. Perhaps these remarks, which might be extended to great length, will show that on the supposition that it was intended to refer to those scenes by the outpouring of this vial, the symbol was well chosen and appropriate. Eliot says, the scorching with fire, we may refer to the sufferings of countries which were exposed to these fearful troubles. The accounts which we have received enable us to appreciate the point and truth of Napoleon's own destruction. Conscription, taxation, loss of life, pillage of property, devastation, and ruin marked his course and sullied the glory of his exploits. Men were scorched with great heat. The fifth vial. The fifth vial is poured out on the seat of the beast. We have already seen, says Eliot, how in the revolution the Romish clergy suffered. Their means of support was withdrawn by the abolition of tithes, the confiscation of the church lands, and the destruction of monastic houses. This was followed by the national abolition of the Romish religion and the raising the churches to the ground. So was the whole French ecclesiastical establishment broken up. 24,000 of the clergy were massacred with horrid atrocities. The terrified remnant fled. So much had the anti-papal spirit increased that the French army urged their march against Rome itself. And the Pope only saved himself by the surrender of several towns and the payment of a large sum of money and the best treasures of the Vatican. At length, the decree went forth for the humbling of the beast himself. In 1809, Napoleon declared the Pope's temporal dominion at an end. The estates of the church were next to France, and Rome was degraded to be the second city of the French Empire. Surely, on the seat of the beast, the vial of wrath had been poured out. Subsequently, the Pope was brought prisoner to France, and there, as prisoner, he received a stated salary. True, he afterwards gained back the privilege of fixing his seat at Rome, But the world had seen his weakness, and a precedent was established for the benefit of future generations. In France, the Romish religion continued only to be tolerated 
on an equality with other religions. In Portugal and Spain, church property has been lately confiscated, and in Italy, still later events show that the papal authority, if unsupported by the temporal power, has not any longer in itself that which can maintain its supremacy. The sixth vial. The drying up the, of the Euphrates flood under the sixth vial had long been understood to refer to the wasting away of the Turkish and Mohammedan power, which, according to prophecy, was to follow the judgments of the French Revolution. The Turks, who had overthrown the corrupt Eastern Empire of Rome, had come into Europe. From the upper stream of the river Euphrates, all over southeastern Europe, the flood had extended as far as Venice. It had been a fearful woe on Eastern Christendom. In 1820, a formidable insurrection against the Turkish power began in Greece, which quickly spread to Wallachia, Moldavia, and Aegean Isles. In 1826, Turkey was obliged to surrender to Russia all its fortresses in Asia, and frightful civil commotions distracted Constantinople, ending in the slaughter of the Janissaries, when 4,000 veteran but mutinous and unmanageable soldiers were shot or burned to death by order of the Sultan himself in their own barracks in the city, and many thousands more all over the country. The empire had for centuries groaned under their tyranny, and, and Mahmoud II was resolved to organize a fresh army on the military system of Western Europe, and saw no other way of delivering himself from the tyrannical Janissaries than this awful massacre, which, while it liberated Turkey from an intolerable incubus, at the same time materially weakened her strength before a fresh army had been matured. Russia again attacked the Turkish Empire, and backed up by England and France, secured the independence of Greece after the great battle of Navarino, in which the Ottoman fleet was totally destroyed. In 1828 and 29, Russia again invaded Turkey. Her armies crossed the Balkans and penetrated as far as Adrianople, where a treaty more disastrous to the port than any previous one was concluded. The freedom of Serbia was secured, and no Turk was permitted to reside in future north of the Danube, while Russia obtained one of those mouths of that great river and territory to the south of it, the large Turkish province of Algeria and North Africa was lost to the sublime port and became a French colony in the following year. In 1832, Turkey was brought to the verge of a dissolution in consequence of the successful rebellion of the powerful Pasha of Egypt, Mehmet Ali. He attacked and conquered Syria and defeated the Turkish armies in three great battles. And he would have taken Constantinople had not the Western nations intervened. A second rebellion on the part of Egypt took place in 1840 when Ibrahim Pasha defeated the Turks at Nizib. The Turkish fleet was betrayed into the power of Muhammad Ali and taken to Alexandria, and Europe was obliged to again interfere to protect the Sultan from the rebellion of his vassal, who could at any time have easily overthrown the Turkish Empire. In the following year, the British Admiral took Sidon, Beirut, and St. Jean de Acre, and in order to restore the Turkish rule, which had been completely lost, drove Muhammad Ali out of Syria. Egypt has been, however, virtually independent ever since, and her present rulers bear the title of Khedive, or King, in recognition of the fact. They are now far more under the power of England than that of Turkey. In 1844, the port was compelled by the Christian nations of Europe to issue an edict of religious toleration, abolishing forever its characteristic and sanguinary practice of execution for apostasy, 
that is, for the adoption of the Christian faith, as this was entirely against its will, because against the precepts of the Koran, and contrary to the practice of all the ages during which Mohammedism has been in existence. It was a most patent proof that the Ottoman independence was gone. As a matter of fact, though often mentioned still as a plausible fiction of diplomacy, and that henceforth it had to shape its conduct in accordance with the views of its neighbors, the Christian nations of Europe, it was completely compulsory sheathing of the sword of persecution, which had been relentlessly wielded for over twelve centuries, a most marked era in the overthrow of the Mohammedan power. And when we get back from uh, this, uh, this coming break here, we'll continue with the seventh vial on page 143, if you're following along in History Unveiling Prophecy. You're listening to Cross the Border. My name is Nicholas. The name of this, this broadcast is Prophecy Reality, which we do here once a week. We have a Prophecy Reality News Hour. We talk about uh, what's in the news, if anything, having to do with prophecy. We talk about several prophecy topics, questions in the chat room, and your calls, if we do get any. And then uh, second hour, we are until we're completed with it, going through history, unveiling prophecy. Go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and there, subscribe to my blog, and take advantage of the resources there. I have a free ebook tab. Um, read my latest book, When the Third Temple is Built, The Rapture Play Will Begin. And believe me, it's a play, and it's a fictional play. They believe, and this is what they teach, that when the temple is built, whoever brings the treaty to build that temple is going to be their antichrist of left-behind rapture eschatology or futurism. And the Holy Spirit will be removed from the earth, and all true believers, true rapture believers, will be raptured away. But I'm saying that's not biblical. It's all a fantasy. It's all a farce. Because the rapture is not the resurrection. They're two different things. The rapture is a fantasy. It is a fiction made up by counter-reformation Jesuit co-adjutors based upon the left, the, the end-time antichrist eschatology of a, the Jesuit Francisco Ribera. And they have done their job really well to where Protestantism has become obsolete, unknown, and evangelical rapturists have taken their place. We'll be back in a few minutes. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone, absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. 
These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. You're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, we're, we'll continue going through Prophecy Unveiling History uh, or Time as an Interpreter. Uh, everyone should have a copy of this book uh, or of uh, The Last Prophecy, which is an abridgment of E.B. Eliot's Hori Apocalypti. Okay? Uh, these two great works on and uh, the book of Revelation uh, should be in everyone's library so that you don't fall for the fallacy, uh, the, the speculative futurist eschatology, which the proponents of which have nothing to prove because it's all future. It's all speculation. They don't have to verify anything. They don't have to prove anything. What a handy way to sell something that you don't have to prove or verify. However, with the historicist or the historical interpretation of the Revelation, we have history to verify our interpretation of prophecy. And that is the method that God demonstrates in the Bible itself. That is the method we see uh, in the prophets of old. The prophecy is given. And God, uh, for instance, Daniel chapter 2, there's a prophecy given uh, to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. Uh, consequently, Daniel reveals the prophecy and the dream and the prophecy and its interpretation he gets from God. And we see that it follows a chronology, a layout of history that has yet to come. And we see that it is a history that was laid out and was fulfilled in succession over time without any gaps in it whatsoever. And this is the pattern that we see in chapter 11 of the book of Daniel. We see a layout of history. The time period, the main focus, the time period of the 11th chapter of Daniel is the 490 years or the 70 weeks period of time. All of the machinations of the nations that would happen take place during that period of time are laid out in the same way that the book of Revelation is laid out. A succession of, of political machinations having to do with Israel or God's visible church on earth. And so we jump forward to the revelation and God gives uh, John an outline and he writes it down in a book of a succession of what would happen with the nations having to do with God's people, the visible church on earth over the next 2000 years until Christ returns. And the time is coming up. We have According to our chronology, the chronology that I get from the scripture itself, we have about 40 years, a little less than 40 years left, um, give or take a year, about the year 2055, the seventh millennium from the creation uh, will begin. And you can check it out for yourself. Get, Go to my website, put a uh, what year is it in the search box there, and you'll find the article and you'll find all of the biblical references outlying this biblical outline uh, uh, that shows us what year it is from the creation account. And yes, I am a young earth creationist, and we are coming up uh, to complete almost 6,000 years at this very time. 
with less than 40 years to go before the seventh millennium begins. It is widely held that the seventh millennium will be the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, let's jump back in where we left off. The seventh vial, and we're on page 140-something here. 143, if you're following along in the book. This is the greatest of the vials and the last. On its outpouring is heard a great voice out of the temple from heaven, from the throne, saying, It is done. As this vial is the destruction of Babylon the Great, the detailed description of that event in Revelation 17, 18, and 19 belong to it and will be fulfilled in its course. The scope of the seventh vial in apocalyptic prophecy is greater than that of all the preceding vials. To it belongs a solemn and sublime description of the issuing force from the opened heaven, the rider on the white horse, in chapter 19, to judge and to make war, whose eyes are a flame of, as a flame of fire, on whose head are many crowns, whose garment is a vesture dipped in blood, whose name is faithful and true, the word of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of Lords, whose followers are the armies in heaven, seated upon a white, seated upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, from whose mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, who shall rule the nations with a rod of iron, and who treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and as the final treading of the great winepress of the wrath of God is described at the close of the parenthetical visions in Revelation 14. That judgment also belongs to the seventh, to those of the seventh vial, in which, according to Revelation 19, the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God is trodden. If the winepress is not trodden twice over, both passages must refer to the same event and hence the destruction of the vine of the earth, or harvest of the vintage, in chapter 14, takes place under the seventh vial. Its prediction is as follows. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And further to the judgment of the seventh vial belongs the Armageddon conflict and its issues of the 19th of Revelation, under which the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies are gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, when the beast is taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and both are cast alive into the lake of fire. This final destruction of the anti-Christian host is that of the supper of the great God, to which all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven are called to come, that they may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. The events of the seventh vial, as described in Revelation 16, are as follows. 1. The preliminary warning. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. 2. The gathering together of the anti-Christian hosts, into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Three, the pouring out of the seventh vial into the air. 
not as previous vials on the earth, on the sea, on the rivers and fountains of waters, and on the sun, all of which spheres are local and restricted, but into the air, a universal judgment on the sphere of Satan's government, as the prince of the power of the air. 4. The great voice out of the temple of heaven, from the throne saying, It is done, a terminal sentence, analogous to the It is finished of Calvary, and It is done of the new creation, in chapter 21, 6. 5. The voices and thunders and lightning. 6. The great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. 7. The tripart division of the great city Babylon. The great city was divided into three parts. The great city of chapter 11, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The city whose tenth part had fallen by the great earthquake which followed the death, resurrection, and ascension of the witnesses, the great city Babylon of the judgment described in chapter 18, at the smoke of whose burning ascends the cry, What city is like unto this great city? That great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, that mighty city whose merchandise of all precious things includes the bodies and souls of men, which as a great millstone cast into the sea shall be thrown down and found no more at all, the city by whose sorceries were all the nations deceived and in which was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. 8. The fall of the cities of the nations. 9. The coming of great Babylon in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. 10. The convulsion in which every island fled away and the mountains were not found. 11. The great hailstorm falling on men out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, men blaspheming because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And this is part five of the of our chapter on the French Revolution. Termination of the 1260 years of papal domination. This great prophetic period is mentioned no less than seven times in Daniel and the Revelation. First, as a as three and a half prophetic times in Daniel 7. The persecuting little horn, arising among the ten horns of the divided Roman Empire, and distinguished from them by his episcopal character as having eyes of intelligent oversight, eyes like the eyes of a man, and by his proud self-exalting utterances, having a mouth that spoke very great things, was to exercise tyrannical dominion over the saints, and they were to be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. Second, as to the three and a half times of the scattering and subjugation of the holy people in Daniel 12. And I heard a man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swore by him that liveth for ever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Third, as forty-two months, during which the holy city shall be trodden under foot, Revelation 11.2, the court which is without the temple leave out, or cast out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Fourth, as the twelve hundred and sixty days of the prophesying of the sackcloth clothed witnesses, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. That's Revelation 11.3. Fifth, 
as the 1260 days during which the persecuted woman is hidden and fed in the wilderness. Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled to the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. 6. As the time, times, and a half during which the woman is nourished from the persecuting dragon who had been cast down from his place of exaltation. Revelation 12, 13, and 14. When the dragon saw that he was cast out into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war on the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Seventh, as 42 months during the 10 horned beast power exercises dominion, finally making war with the saints and overcoming them, Revelation 13, 5. And there was given to him mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue forty and two months. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Discussion As twelve hundred and sixty days are equal to forty two months of thirty days each, and as 42 months equal three and a half years, it is evident that one and the same period is intended. Should this period be interpreted on the day-day scale or the year-day scale? In other words, are the 1260 days to be taken as literal days of 24 hours each or as symbolic days representing 1260 years? We have discovered that the beasts of Daniel and the Revelation with their heads and horns and times are symbolic representatives of historic events and periods. The reduction is on an enormous scale as when our world is represented by a globe or a foot in diameter. The fulfillment of one of these prophetic periods on the year-day scale supplies the key to all the rest. The 70 weeks of Daniel 9 extended from the decree of Artaxerxes to the advent of the death of the Messiah was fulfilled, not as a literal weeks or 490 days, but 490 years. Further, both in the law and the prophets, the scale is employed in relation to the times prophetically announced. In the law of Moses, in the words, after the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall be a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years. And in the prophecies of Ezekiel in the passages, I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days, so shall thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on their right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year." Let these facts in relation to the prophetic times be duly considered, and especially the words I have appointed thee each day for a year, and the conclusion will be apparent that the clearly symbolic times of Daniel and the Revelation may be interpreted on the year-day scale. So the year-day principle also demonstrated in the Old Testament prophets may be applied to other prophecies depending on context and language. For example, the 1260 days, 42 months, times, time and a half are considered almost universally as referring to the same period of 1260 years of the reign of the papacy, simply because the inconsistent method of reference to the same period indicates the use of symbolic language, which rules out the literal interpretation in the contexts. An exhaustive and mastery, masterly treatise on the year-day system from the pen of Reverend T. R. Burks, Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, 
professor of moral philosophy appeared more than 50 years ago, or 150 years ago, and uh, given today, uh, in his work entitled First Elements of Sacred Prophecy, a book now difficult to procure. The following is a brief summary of the general scope of the argument. The year-day theory, says Professor Burks, may be summed up in these maxims. One, that the church, after the ascension of Christ, was intended of God to be kept in the lively expectation of his speedy return in glory. Two, that the divine counsels that in the divine councils, a long period of nearly 2,000 years was to intervene between the first and second advent and to be marked by a dispensation of grace to the Gentiles. Three, that in order to strengthen the faith and hope of the church under the long delay, a large part of the whole interval was prophetically announced, but in such a manner that its true length might not be understood until its close seemed to be drawing near. Four, that in the symbolic prophecies of Daniel and St. John, other times were revealed along with this and included under one common maxim of interpretation. Five, that the periods thus figuratively revealed are exclusively those of Daniel and St. John, which relate to the general history of the church between the time of the prophet and the second advent. Six, that in these predictions, each day represents a natural year, as in the vision of Ezekiel, that a month denotes 30, and a time or year 360 years. The first of these maxims is plain from the statements of the scripture, and the second from the actual history of the world. The third is on a, a priori grounds, a natural and reasonable inference from the two former, and is the true basis of the year-day theory viewed in its final cause. The three following present the theory itself under its true limits. Perhaps no simpler method could be suggested in which such a partial and half-veiled revelation could be made than that which the Holy Spirit is thus supposed to adopt, resting as it does on the plain analogy of natural times starting point of the 1260 years of papal dominion. The decree of the Emperor Justinian in 533 and that of Emperor Phocas in 607 conferred on the Bishop of Rome headship over all the churches of Christendom. Justinian's starting point of the 1260 years. The commencement of the 1260 years, says Cunningham, is to be marked by the giving of the saints and times and laws into the hands of the little horn. Quote, that the little horn is the papacy has been established with such force of evidence by Bede, Bishop Newton, Faber, and other witnesses on prophecy that I do not consider it at all to enter upon the proof of it. The papacy, being the spiritual power within the limits of the Roman Empire, Mr. Faber argues, I think rightly, when he says that giving of the saints into the hand of the papacy must be by some formal act of the secular power of that empire constituting the pope to be the head of the church. It is not, in fact, easy to conceive in what other mode saints could be delivered into the hands of a spiritual authority which in its infancy at least must have been in a great measure dependent upon the secular power for its very existence and much more for every decree of active power which it was permitted to assume or exercise. And I think we should have stopped there, but we're going to pick up right there next week when we do part 15. May the Almighty bless each and every one of you as you continue. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.
When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.